Thanks, Scott. Um, it's good to, good to see everybody's names here. And um, we already have some questions coming in. That's good. We'll get to those in just a minute. I, um, I wanted to talk today. Uh, th this is a common enough question that I get um, really early on in recovery. Um, I want to talk about, do we even have something worth saving? Um, should we be together? And I think that's actually a question that can be answered early on. Um, and it, it actually can be really useful to answer that question early on. Um, keep in mind that what I'm going to talk about is general principles around that. Um, I cannot give any specific advice for your situation because that would merit an assessment. And um, I also, uh, ultimately, I feel like it's way too sacred a decision for anybody but you and your partner to decide if your relationship should continue. Um, so... Uh, there it is. We'll, we'll talk about, do we even have something worth saving? So um, I want everybody to think about pandas. It's fun, right? Um, I'm sure you've seen those videos of pandas. Uh, my wife and I have been getting a big kick lately out of watching pandas fall down things because um, they're just like a ball and it's really funny. Um, pandas are a global symbol for wildlife and eco protection. Think a minute about why. Um, think about whales. Um, whales are also a global symbol for uh, wildlife and eco-protection, um, uh, protecting our oceans. Why? Um, I know a long, uh, not a while ago, there was a big push to make sure that fleets that fished tuna weren't also uh, getting dolphins. Um, why do we care so much about dolphins? Um, in another vein, um, I was thinking recently, I was remembering a few years ago, do y'all remember the day that the Notre Dame Cathedral burned? Do you remember how you felt when you learned that uh, it was on fire and it wasn't a small fire? Um, I remember feeling really sick and I've never seen Notre Dame. Um, I've never been to, to France. Um, I've studied it in art history. Um, why do we get this kind of feeling uh, when we think about losing things like pandas, whales, dolphins, Notre Dame Cathedral, you even have the Buddhas, uh, the Buddhas of um, Bamiyan in Afghanistan that were destroyed by the Taliban um, during that world. Why do we feel sad when we think about losing those things? Um, or we get a visceral reaction when we're confronted by these losses. It's because all of these things are unique and they're special. Um, there's nothing else quite like them. Um, just, just for illustration purposes, um, there is a fish, uh, kokanee salmon, um, that uh, they're, in a, they're in a reservoir near where I live, and they're a protected species. Um, I don't get the same reaction when I think about kokanee going extinct because they're just these little, they're fish. They, they look like just about any other fish. Um, it's the uniqueness. Um, it's the uh, I iconicness, it's the specialness. Um, anybody who's ever been on a whale tour or a, a dolphin tour and you see them interact, like there's this, dare I say, it's this spiritual moment of, of seeing this and interacting. It's same, same thing with like great works of art or world heritage sites. There's something about the specialness and uniqueness that uh, impels us to protect and to keep it around. So, so keep that in mind as we talk about, is there something even worth saving? Because that's the, that's the crux of it. That's the backbone. Um, that's a question that I think has to be early on answered in recovery. Otherwise, what I'll see couples do, and particularly folks who struggle with addiction, they waste a lot of time doing more damage and not caring about the impact on the relationship. So this is what focuses you on um, the, the answer to this, do we have something we're saving focuses you on um, doing things that don't do further damage to your relationship. And you can actually turn that corner really fast if you, if you have a, a powerful enough answer to this question. So um, when, when you wonder, do we have something we're saving? A lot of um, couples that I ask, why should you two be together? There's a couple main things that they say. Um, first of all, I'll hear, well, we don't want to get divorced. And I'll say to them, um, not getting divorced is not a relationship goal. What else do you have? Because um, this isn't just about what we don't want. It's about what we do have, what's worth protecting. 
I'll also hear a lot of couples say, well, we want to stay together for the kids. And I'll say, um, that's a nice idea. I'm glad you're thinking about them. Still not sufficient because um, you hire nannies and babysitters. You send them off to school with teachers who hopefully are loving and care for them. Bottom line, um, it doesn't take two people who are married or committed to each other to raise fantastic children together. So while they are good reasons, they're not sufficient to motivate the kind of focus and the kind of commitment it takes to stop hurting your relationship. Um, I know lots of couples who really do love their children are some of the, the um, most loving devoted parents I've seen and they're terrible to each other. Um, those two things can exist. So when you think about it in terms of what's special about our relationship or what's so special about this person, in other words, what am I getting here or what's available here that I don't think I could get anywhere else? I asked this of a couple earlier this week, and um, he said, nobody knows me as well as she does. Um, nobody's been with me um, uh, as long as she has. I don't have any friends that have lasted this long. That's more in the dolphin, whale, panda, Notre Dame category. Now that's special. Someone who has my history and has been here. Um, someone who's been through a lot with me. That's more in that, that category of, I, I couldn't reproduce that. I couldn't pay someone to give me that. I couldn't find that ready-made anywhere else. Um, that's the kind of stuff that starts to get us focused on what we stand to lose and just how important our relationship is. Um, there are some parts of intimate partnership that are interchangeable. Um, think of the stuff that you could pay people to do or um, that I, you could find someone who's willing to do it. Um, you know, a, a stranger would be willing to do it. Well, this is my ride to the airport. Well, there's, there's a whole, there's a, a couple of apps and lots of services around people taking you to the airport. You don't need a partner for that. Um, so when we, um, when we don't know what is special about our relationship or we don't remember, or maybe there isn't anything that we feel like is unique or worth saving here, um, we're much more prone to act reflexively and act in our own self-interest rather than recognizing what we do has an impact on these. I'll tell you the, the last time I went on a dolphin tour, um, we had, we'd spent a week in Disneyland and then our, our last day in California, we went on a dolphin tour and um, the tour company was great and the guides were great. And they talked to us a lot about, uh, you know, dolphins and fish and whales. And they didn't bring this up at all, but I left that tour saying, I'm not going to eat animals anymore um, because I got this uh, sense that there's more there than just a dumb reflexive beast. Um, again, there was a sense of specialness. There's something that was worth protecting. And I came to that conclusion all on my own. That's, that's the power we have when we get real about what is it that I get from this person or in this relationship that I couldn't get anywhere else. It, it brings this sense of, I, I'll call it reverence to us. It brings a sense of seriousness. No, I can't just take it for granted that this is out here. I have to play a role. And when it's only two of you, it's a big role to play. I have to play a big role in protecting this. Um, I'll also hear from some people, my religion prohibits divorce or I don't believe in divorce. That's fine too, actually. Um, the, the alternative to there's nothing special here um, or there's nothing I couldn't get somewhere else, it's not always divorce. Um, if, if that's not an option for you or leaving is not an option for whatever reason, you still have two really important choices in front of you. So if you're not going to leave, if you can't leave, um, are you two going to give each other um, a really good life and a wonderful relationship or are you going to torture each other? Because that's really the, the two choices that are on tap if you stay. And again, when you think about uh, two people spending decades of their life making one another miserable, um, to me, that brings images of like uh, this long line of cruel things that people do to each other. Again, it brings up that feeling of like, I don't, I don't think humans are built to live that way. Um, e even if uh, we can't 
uh, love each other, even if we don't want each other, even if we're here out of a belief or out of a duty, why would we torture each other um, as a result of that? You can still get something really good in a relationship that doesn't have what a lot of people would call spark. Um, so um, it's important uh, on a daily basis, especially early in recovery, if you're struggling with the shock of disclosure or you're struggling with distortion that comes in addiction and your relationship is suffering as a result, even if you don't think your relationship is suffering, if you're in a relationship and you're in one of those positions, you need to think on a daily basis. You need to challenge yourself to think on a daily basis. Um, what's so special about this? What's worth protecting and preserving here? Because that's, in, in my experience, this is one of the reasons why I've, I've gone from doing a lot of individual work to couples work. Because I feel like there's more leverage to get people healthy in a coupleship, especially when they want to be together. Um, especially when they really do admire each other. Because when you remember that, when you remember what there is to lose and you see it and you see how your actions today affect your partner, there's a lot of motivation for change. Um, it becomes instinctive to get more careful, to be conservation minded, to be protection minded. Um, another way of looking at that is, do I feel like I have the best deal in the world here? There's nothing better out there for me. And that would, again, in early recovery, that has to be big picture because when you think of the early days of recovery, no, you don't have the best deal. <laughs> you're with someone who's angry because you've just betrayed them or you're with someone who's defensive because they're scared. But again, you think big picture. Um, so so this, is, this is a tough thing to do early on and, and I'm gonna recommend it, but only temporarily. So for a moment, you have to think based on who this person is, not what they're doing or what they've done. For a moment. Because if there's someone and they're not, well, I've never been this, per they've never been this person and they could be, or I've seen little glimpses, but really this, this feeling of, I know this is you and I love that, or that's really important to me. Um, for a moment, that's what you have to get in touch with. And then you focus on, um, this is really important to me. Don't cover that up with your lies, your deceit, your addiction. Um, even I, 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 I don't mean to be flippant here, but, um, don't cover that up by staying in untreated PTSD because that's a life ruin or two. It's not your fault that you got there, but it's really important to do things about it because it can take over your life, that fear and um, all the things that come out of that. Um, in essence, you're asking, even if all the bad was sorted out, do I want this person? Um, that's really important and I would say possible early on in recovery to be thinking about. Not are they bugging me right now, but do we have something that can't be replicated? It's, it's a way to focus. It's a way to leverage what you stand to lose because in early recovery, it's all about um, limiting the scope of damage that's done. Not limiting our awareness of damage, but limiting the scope of damage. And again, I see people in early recovery be, be consumed by the fear, um, be consumed by the, the anger, be consumed by uh, the defensiveness, all sorts of things. And um, they lose sight of this fragile relationship, this valuable thing to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this morning is because I've worked with my share of couples who, who got near the end um, of a really long, hard recovery process and had a lot of regrets for what they put each other through early on because they didn't get it. They didn't realize um, that this is, this is a personal relationship that actually meant a lot to them. And they, uh, they thought they could have it all. Um, we can't, I've talked about this before. Deal breakers are important in a relationship. It's important to know what our limits are, um, what could break our partner. It's also important for us to know what it is about our partner and our relationship that's worth saving, worth protecting. So that is, uh, do we even have something worth saving? Thank you, John. Um, you know, I, I find myself scribbling notes always when you talk. And I was like, why would I stay in a relationship I'm single? But if I was, and number one, you know, in addition to, I love the, you know, she knows me or he knows me. Um, and we have a history together. Nobody else 
you know, I can't get that with anybody else, but also, you know, do we have fun together? Yeah. Um, are we, are we low stress? Uh, because, uh, you know, if it's high stress constantly, eh, that's not so great. But again, you mentioned like right now it might be high stress, but are we, did we used to be low stress? Are we capable of being low stress? But other things like mutual emotional support, like I got your back, you got my back kind of thing. Um, we're a team, um, you know, yeah. And, and I loved your, so that was just for me, that was just my thoughts and I thought I'd share them. But the other thing you said about something better out there, and this is something because I primarily deal with addicts, um, I know you primarily deal with couples, but you know, I get that in male addicts um, and they'll say, you know, I don't know, she's just so mean to me right now. I don't know if, and I'm like, and my response is you're on your third marriage. <laughs> you know, what's the common denominator here? You know, you might think there's something better out here, out there, but the problem is not them, it's you. So, so I always kind of look at that question too, so. Yeah, and that, you know, that that makes me think I've, I've certainly heard that. Well, yeah, there is. And I'll, I'll say, I, I, I do use, I, I use humor a lot in therapy. I'll say, all right, name five people that you know, who would be better. Well, I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, this type of person. And what I'll say to them is, okay, well, why don't what you do get in some recovery relationships, get in 12 steps, get a sponsor, get a group, let people see you as you are, and just see if you only get glowing reviews. Um, cause again, in addiction, a lot of what we think a relationship should be, or what we should be experiencing is based in fantasy, not in our lived experience. And, um, it, it's not catastrophic that a lot of addicts start there. They just have to be willing to reality test that when I really get in and I am who I am and I show people that, um, is it only, is it this, you know, completely loving and patient and, uh, you know, whatever thing that I really want from my spouse because they're so mean right now. I'm, I'm thinking of a, a client I worked with a while ago. Um, he, uh, I mean, he had a sponsor sent from heaven, just really, really good sponsor. And one of the things that the sponsor did with him after they were working together about six weeks and he wasn't getting sober his um, sponsor said, uh, listen, I think you'll get sober when you want to. And it start get, it's starting to get to a point for me where I feel like my time might be better spent somewhere else. And um, luckily, this guy was in a position where he could hear that. And he actually asked his sponsor some follow-up questions. And it was totally, it was the right hit across the head um, for him that very soon after that, he figured out how to get sober again, because he had a relationship that was worth keeping. And it was a real relationship. It wasn't this, this false idea. And um, he even said to his sponsor, I'm a little surprised to hear this. I thought you were supposed to be my cheerleader. And he said, no, I'm, I'm here to make sure you get better. Um, and uh, you don't need cheerleading right now. You need a reality check. Um, so when we really are who we are and we let ourselves do that in like recovery program, we, we might get our calibrations adjusted on what a good relationship actually is. Because most of the addicts that I, I know, they, they've never actually been in a relationship because they haven't been honest. They haven't been themselves. Yeah, it, it, this kind of reminds me, we talk a lot about sex and porn addiction are fantasies. Um, the appeal of them is the fantasy. These are fantasy-based addictions. Um, if I'm having an affair, it's a fantasy. I'm, I'm having dinner out at hotel sex, and that is not a real relationship. Um, a real relationship is when I take the garbage out and we pay the bills together, and I, you know, and I'm there sitting, sleeping in the same bed with you when you're coughing up a lung because you're sick. Um, you know, that's a relationship. Um, you know, dinner out at hotel sex is not a relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, I've also heard, and I first heard this from Pat Karn, but I think he borrowed it from somebody else, you know, sobriety is a commitment to reality at all costs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we need to get past this fantasy and get into the reality. Um, and then we can look at, should I stay or should I go? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this, this isn't a question, I just want to clarify, I wasn't talking about today, should I stay or should I go? I was talking about what motivates me. Right. To be, and getting the right motivation because like like i said well we have kids or we don't want to get divorced 
th those are fine reasons, but they're not sufficient to make a good relationship, which is when, when I, when I talk to people who are early in recovery, um, I don't know if they have the same motivation I do for them, but I want them to have the very best life possible as a result, not just getting past the crisis. Yeah, and I think you and I have both seen people who stay together until the kids are off to college or something like that. And they, but they agree to be cordial to each other and, you know, get along for the sake of the kids. And I mean, if somebody wants to do that, or, I mean, like you said, you can't tell them whether to, you know, they should stay or go and yeah, without, but I mean, how do you, how do you deal with it when somebody makes that decision? Yeah, we're not together, but we're going to act like we are for the sake of the kids. Yeah, well, when when I, I I have couples who are doing that as we speak, and what I say to them, great. Um, if you're going to stay together and you're going to do it for the kids, you have to really make sure the kids benefit from this, because if you two aren't careful, you are going to torture your children, and you're going to make them wish every day that mom would, and dad would just get brave and break up because they're not doing us any favors. So um, again, the the end goal doesn't have to be. Uh, we're going to stay together and be in love to get secure functioning. It's, it's, it's more of a practical matter. And this is what's important early on in recovery is um, am I contributing to a relationship that helps the people who are in connection with it and dependent on it or that tortures them? So I think there's an ethical duty to um, not, uh, not let our relationships fall into disrepair so that everybody else has to pay the price for our, our bad relationship. Thank you. Um, okay, let's jump into the Q and A. We've got several here. Um, I don't know how to be or feel being with my spouse when I just found out um, after two years in recovery that he lied uh, within lies within lies the entire time. So he's been lying the whole time. We've had two full disclosures and pa and he's passed two lie detector tests that he should have failed. Now he is writing the third disclosure. Um, I don't know what to think anymore. Um, oh wow. Um... I'm so sorry, first of all. Um, I, I don't see a question in there, but I'll, I'll speak to that just a little bit. Um, I think it's really important when we're uh, going about this really difficult, complicated work that you're really clear on what you wanna get out of it. And when you say there's been two, uh, two past disclosures and two lie detectors that he should have failed, um, I hope you're not just going to the same rodeo again on this third one, meaning I hope it's not done exactly the way that it was done before, because I think you have some evidence, and I'm not saying overall that that disclosures and lie detectors don't work, but it doesn't seem to get what you wanted to get out of it. So I would just encourage you to uh, think about what you want to have as a result of continuing work and um, make that a really short-term goal. Um, yeah, that's, that's heartbreaking. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. And, and yeah, I, yuck, yuck, <laughs> yuck. I feel yuck for you. I'm sorry. Um, hi, uh, let's just go to the next one here. Hi, my husband is five months sober, but he still has zero empathy. Um, it's all about him. He is in complete victim mode. Um, he's with shame, depression, anger. He's not willing to do any work outside of the two 12-step meetings he goes to and his CSAT. Um, I feel like giving up on this marriage. I'm asking, am I asking for too much? Um, I want him to do 12-step work, listen to podcasts, read books, work on his disclosure, and help me feel safe by following my boundaries. Um, there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, I'll let you address. Uh, I'll probably have some follow ups for you. Yeah. So, one of the things that comes up for me here, um, there's two things that I think are really clear in here that uh, when, when you say, Am I asking for too much? Um, you, you may be asking really broadly instead of really specifically. It sounds like two things that you really want. I need a full disclosure so that I have honesty on the table and I know what it is I'm signing up for. Keep asking for that. Um, and then the other part, I want him to help me feel safe by following my boundaries. My question would be, are you two in marriage therapy right now? That may be something that's missing right now. Um, it's, 
it's an alluring idea that um, when my partner gets in addiction recovery and they start getting better, our relationship will at, at the very at the very best be fixed, at the very least be better. Um, individual work and healing is a different animal than marriage work and healing. Um, so uh, I would just caution everybody out there to evaluate how many eggs you put in the basket of my relationship's going to get better when my spouse gets better. Um, because my, my friend Carver Brown always describes the old crusty people who have years and years of sobriety, um, but don't really get the spirit of what uh, the 12 steps are teaching. And so when it comes to business meetings, they argue about the correct direction to pass the basket around at the end of the group. Um, you can get sobriety and still be terrible at relationships. You can even get addiction recovery and be terrible at relationships and, and even your specific marriage. So that would be some, maybe ask for a little bit more focus. Um, we need marital work because uh, I don't feel safe and I don't feel like you're getting it. Or even if you're feeling really generous, uh, it's no secret to us. We have a relationship we both don't like. Um, you interested in fixing that with me? Because um, again, like I said, uh, I love doing marital work with, with couples post-infidelity because there's so much leverage to get uh, people on track uh, when, when they realize uh, their relationship is not just something that can go on autopilot and be fine. They have to step up to the plate. Yeah, um, I have several follow-ups for you. Um, Five months, zero empathy strikes me as not unusual. No, <laughs> I yeah, mean, it no. takes a while to get some empathy. Unfortunately, it takes it takes a significant more amount of time than that, which I'll at the at the at the, the start, I'll just say that's incredibly unfair to the spouses who have been hurt all the way along. Um, but empathy, uh, empathy is not just a skill set we learn it's also like a reorientation of our our brain so it takes time I, I was in my second year i would say near the end of my second year before i genuinely started to have empathy i think yeah. um so so yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't judge his recovery by zero empathy yet um she mentions uh, i'm assuming this is a female questioner um she wants him to follow her boundaries and my understanding of boundaries and, and I'll let you address this is my boundaries are about my behavior and how, I, what I will do to feel safe. They're not about controlling you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, I mean, expecting, you know, we may be confusing the word boundaries with requests. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think that gets confused all the time. Um, Boundaries are really something that whether or not you have your partner's uh, buy-in, you can make happen what you need to have happen. So by definition, boundaries can't control or dictate another's behaviors. Um, you can say uh, things like, um, it will be hard for me to consider trusting you if I don't know that you have a recovery program that you work and that it actually works, that it provides things like empathy and uh, you understand uh, what you've put me through and uh, it produces humility. Um, heck, if, if, if he found a diner that made this special omelet that produced all of those things, I don't think you'd care how he got it, <laughs> as long as he's doing it. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important distinction, Scott. It's not a, it's not a boundary, it's a request, which are valid too. But um, when, when you say to somebody, I'd like you to do this, and they say no, that's actually secure functioning because you know exactly where they stand. Yeah, um, yeah my, my third question here is, um, how much recovery is enough if, if we can quantify? And is there such a thing as too much if we can quantify? And is yeah. that even an answerable question? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast with Gabor Mate a few weeks ago. And those of you who don't know his work, he's, he's a genius in the connection between um, addiction and trauma. Um, his books, The Realm of Hungry Ghosts, The Myth of Normal, um, got some books about ADHD and, and like just really fascinating guy. And he said something in this podcast that surprised me. He said, uh, people go through really horrific things that take up a lot of their lives. 
And he said, uh, sometimes um, they get so trapped in that horrific thing that happens that it becomes their identity. Their primary identity is I'm a trauma survivor. Their primary identity is I went through this, this hard thing and I you know, made it through or I haven't made it through, whatever it is. And um, he said, I would caution everybody to be really, really careful about their relationship to the work they do on healing um, because there is a lot of life outside of mental health and healing. And at some point you need to get on living it. Um, so again, I think about what my, my friend Carver Brown says about the old weird crusty people who have lots of sobriety, but like don't have a clue about relationships um, or don't have a clue about how they come across. Um, just buckling down on getting information about addiction will not make you a fully formed human being. It can be a really important building block, even a cornerstone um, for some people, but there's there's more beyond that. And that's where I really like a like a competency based approach. I'm not doing this stuff to check a box. Like I'm working my tenth step, or I'm I'm working my my fourth and fifth step, so that I can get used to, so I can have this skill of admitting that I've made mistakes and I make those right. They're skill sets, not things to complete. That that's what makes folks healthy. Um, is not just having gone through the motions, but really internalizing and uh, to, to speak neurologically to have deep changes happen in the brain. Yeah, thank you for phrasing it that way because the end game for my recovery is not you know some mountaintop, it's basically being a better person. Uh, you know, I try to do today better than yesterday and that's, that's as good as I can do. And if I'm doing today better than yesterday, I consider myself a recovering person. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, okay, it's been seven months since my husband's messy disclosure. Um, in that time, he has done no real recovery. I've been working on me in counseling for 21 months. It's, um, how does one decide if it's time for a legal separation? I'm trying to save something, our marriage, that he's putting no real effort into. Hmm. This is a really good question. Um, know that my answer won't be comprehensive because everybody's... Uh, Situations are uh, individual and, and distinct and um, have some uniqueness to them. Um, but here, here's a principle I've been thinking about with this. Um, every coupleship that comes to my office, they have figured out how to make a relationship work, meaning they haven't divorced, they haven't separated. So from a very like minimal definition, that is a relationship that works because we're still together in some way. Um, they may not be explicit about it. They may not know, you know how they got there, but they have figured out, they, they know what helps the relationship. Now, if you look at the health of the two individuals, and this is why I see people come to me, not because they're like, our marriage just won't die. <laughs> they, they come to me because they're saying we're miserable in this. So when you have a relationship that works, but is killing one or both people who are part of it, you, you don't have a good relationship. It's as simple as that. When you have a relationship that's working and both parties feel like it is adding to their life, it's making them better people, it gives them everything they want, helps them avoid things they don't, you have a good relationship. Um, separation is a boundary to consider. Um, it's you saying, I can't go on like this. And again, whether I have your participation or not, I'm stepping back. Um, and I think it's important when you consider that, that you have some timelines in mind for yourself. I'm making this big move and I'm going to give you X number of months to um, figure some things out. And here's what I would like to see. And so if you're gonna take this step, you have to have a plan beyond I'm going to separate. You have to know what you're doing and how long you're going to be doing it. And then what's going to come next if the separation doesn't get you what you need. Otherwise, this starts to become a yo-yo. I threaten to leave, but there's really no consequence beyond leaving. And maybe even it might be relieving for one or both of you to be separated because we're not in each other's stuff anymore. So, so again, make sure there's real consequence and that you're ready to follow through a couple steps ahead of a separation if you're considering that. Thank you. 
Um, okay, next one here. I am a sex and porn addict. D-Day was two years ago. Um, I did treatment at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles in 2021. Full therapeutic disclosure one year ago and divorced seven months ago. Um, would you know why I have been resisting doing my step work? <laughs> I'm finally completing my first step and will share with my sponsor and CSAT. Um, interesting question. Why, why, why do people resist their step work? What an interesting question. And um, my simple answer is because it sucks. Step work sucks. It's designed to bring up stuff from within us. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues uh, recently said to me, we can't regulate things that we can't feel or don't feel. I would say we also can't fix problems that we're not aware of. And what I see 12 steps doing, it's like a braking mechanism in a vehicle that has had no brakes for an entire life. It starts to slow you down and it starts to get you feeling. And it's very human nature to avoid things that suck, that are painful. So very simply put, you, you could be resisting because it's really hard. Um, I've really loved having that phrase in my head the last few weeks, you can't regulate things that you can't feel. It actually has gotten me revisiting some things in my life that I've fallen into an avoidance pattern with. And um, while it hurts to feel those things, I want to, cause I don't wanna be, um, I don't wanna just have to go with the flow with that stuff. I don't wanna just have to react. I don't want the chaos anymore. I'm really sick of chaos. So um, that's some of what you can do to overcome that resistance is get to the why. Why am I even interested in this? And how does it matter to me today? Not, um, you know, something that's really big and 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 not immediate enough. Find some very immediate reasons why it would be worth it to face the pain because it is. There's no way around it. Working your steps will bring you pain. Um, that's not a flaw in the design, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this individual ha has done treatment um, at our treatment center in Los Angeles. I know you did a timeline when you were there, which is a lot of the step one work right there. And then a full therapeutic disclosure a year ago, which again is a lot of the step one work. Um, but those are both highly supported processes where you're not left to suffer the pain alone. Mm -hmm. And And I find step work when I'm doing the step work I'm usually sitting at my desk by myself. Um, the joy of it is sharing it with my sponsor, uh, with my CSAT, um, where I live. We we read our step ones out loud in our 12-step group so everybody gets to know us. But, um, you know, I encourage you to finish this first step and share it because that's when the relief comes, at least in my experience. Um, very well said. I, I, I've also appreciated in my own personal step work, I've appreciated paradigms that have um, helped me understand um, working the steps is not always about like a deep doctoral dissertation. Um, there's an argument to be made in the original AA steps. They were meant to be worked quickly and often. So again, remember their skill sets. So um, you may have an incomplete first step or it doesn't go all the way deep. There might be some value in uh, sitting down with your sponsor and even just doing a verbal first step. Let me talk through what's coming up in my mind right now. And uh, it, it, it's like exercising a, a stiff hinge. Um, the more you do it, and like, like Scott uh, very rightly said, the uh, sharing is where the relief comes from. Get to that as fast as possible. And if, if after you do it once, you still need work on your first step, that's fine. Again, it's it's a skill set, not an accomplishment. Yeah. Um, this next one's not a question; it's just a statement. I'm in love with my wife with two exclamation points, and I think that's awesome. <laughs> that might be a reason to stay. <laughs> yeah, that we that we were talking about. Um, um, next one I, is a is a question. Huh? I'll just say I hope that's shared. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's so very good for you too. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you recommend partners heal the PTSD when we are repeatedly betrayed <clears throat> for years? Every time I get, begin to heal, I find myself going back to square one, as that seems to be when the addiction takes over him. Um, do you have any tools? Thank you. Hmm. I don't have any specific tools, but I have a poem that I really love um, that I think relates to this kind of stuff. 
And I'll preface it with, I, I love this poem because um, I think it gets at the point that the, at the heart of any kind of healing, especially stuff that happens over and over again, it's creativity. So here's the poem, autobiography in five short chapters. Um, and it's by Portia Nelson from the book, There's a Hole in My Sidewalk. Chapter one, I walk down the street, there's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in, I am lost, I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find my way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I still don't see it. I fall in again, and I can't believe that I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault, and it takes a long time to get out. I'll just note here, too, um, as these progress, there's not an ideal chapter to be in. All of these chapters are true, and they're valid for, for where you're at in your, your journey. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there and I still fall in. It's habit. It's my fault. I know where I am and I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. Um, again, the, the, the tone of the poem or, or the purpose of me sharing that is not to say get to chapter five because um, all of those chapters could have gone really differently. There's so many different ways to handle that. And um, a, a focus or a tool I would suggest is focus on the part of you that can think creatively and flexibly. And if it's not there, work on getting it there so that you can see a different way around. And it sounds like in, in your follow-up here, um, it sounds like you may be doing that. Um, I'll assume here, this may be the first time you've considered separation. Um, again, that's some of the uh, some of the creativity. I'm willing to do something. I'm willing to try something I haven't before because what I'm doing is not it's not getting me what I want. Scott, I think you're muted. There we go. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, we had a couple of follow ups there, so I'm skipping to the next question here. Um, my wife is scared that I'm not in my recovery. I'm 18 months sober. I tell her I'm in recovery every day. I have a recovery group once a week, SAA meeting once a week, men's Christian group once a week, Bible study and church therapist, uh, et cetera. Um, we have had full disclosure, a men's letter, and numerous sex addiction books. Any help would be appreciated. Thanks. I'm in love with her and want to make love only to her. This is this is the one who loves, loves his wife. So but the wife still is scared that he's not in his recovery or fully in recovery. Is that A, is that common? B, what sure. can you do about it? Sure. And I'm going to go on a limb here that uh, I'm going to assume that um, what your spouse is meaning is not that you're not in recovery. It's that it doesn't feel good to be in a relationship with you yet, um, which is really, really different than um, being in recovery. Um so there's a saying from AA, you earn it to own it. So uh, if, if, my, if my assumption is right, that your wife is scared that you're not in recovery, it may mean it doesn't feel awesome to be in a relationship with you yet. Um, earn it. And, and I will say here, this is something I left out uh, of the, the lecture a little earlier. Um, love is great, but it's not sufficient to make a relationship good. Um, there are all sorts of people in my life who I know love me to pieces and they drive me crazy and they even hurt me. Um, so don't rely on just loving to be enough. You have to learn who the person is that you're with and um, you have to know how to take really, really good care of them and then do it. So um, that, that's where I say recovery alone won't make you better at relationships. You have to stop and have some of those conversations. How's this feeling for you? How's it working for you? Um, how am I doing as your partner? Do I make your life easier? What's it like to be in a relationship with me? All those kind of things that, that may uh, get you a little more clarity on um, what it is your partner is wanting from you right now. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, and, and it takes betrayed partners a while to learn to trust people again. I mean, um, you know, Dr. Rob sometimes says, if you do everything perfectly, it's going to be at least a year before your partner actually starts to trust you again. And you say, this is, yeah, I mean, you have to do everything perfect and be rigorously honest and have empathy and all this stuff. Uh, and it's still going to take 
you know, a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can we see your cat, Scott? Uh, sorry, he has jumped up onto his uh, cat condo. His name is Blue, and he is now uh, licking a part of his body that I'm not going to show you. So we'll, we'll just skip that one. Um, and anyway, cat cats are not performing monkeys. They're not meant to be put on display. They're meant to be cherished. No, no uh, he's uh, one of the reasons I, I, I like having a background, even though I'm not in love with this background, is um, he often sits behind me and does gross things. So <laughs> you don't have to watch that. Um, yeah, there's, my there's, there's, the, there's the autobiography of a cat in one chapter. I sit behind you yeah. and do gross things. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and with him, that is the truth. Um, okay, next one. Have you read the book Emotional Sobriety by, uh, it's actually Tian with T, Tian Dayton. Um, thoughts about it. My CSAT wants me to read it. I read review online and saw uh, that she mentions Darwin and evolution, brain evolving, uh, instead of credit to my higher power, Lord Jesus Christ as creator. Um, so any you live in an area where religion can sometimes get in the way <laughs> of recovery or recovery can get in the way of, of religion. How do you no. make this work? So, so what I would say, like, um, I have not read this specific book, but I know a lot about the principles and emotional sobriety is a very, very important thing to consider. What I've noticed by and large, um, when people write about evolution and the brain and like how it developed, that's not the point of the book. I actually think that's like brain candy. I think it's almost like close up magic. Like, ooh, look what I can do with my knowledge of like how things, how things work. It's not the point of the book. Um, it may be part of, you know, for some people, this is getting the buy-in. Oh, well, this person's not just spouting off ideas. They're, they're grounded in science or whatever. Um, I, I would say it, it's the old AA thing. Um, take what's useful and leave the rest. I think it would be a shame um, for anybody in lots of parts of their recovery if you preemptively exclude something because you don't think it aligns with what you already believe. Um, because um, addiction recovery is all about recognizing that what you've already believed has gotten you where you've got, and that doesn't mean where you are, and that doesn't mean throw out your faith. It means you you, you might need um, some exposure to some new ideas and new perspectives, and you don't have to give up anything that's working for you. Um, so if if you do decide to do this book, which I would recommend, um, it would probably be fine for you. If it's distracting or not helpful, skip over the parts that talk about evolution and get to the parts that talk about what emotional sobriety is and why it's important. I don't think you have to understand the neuroscience to get what she's saying about this is a thing and you should know about it. That's how I would respond to that. Does that, Scott, does that answer the question you asked? Yes. Um, you know, and, and issues with uh, the G word. Um, as some people will call it. Um, I, I see this in 12-step meetings a lot. Um, people will come in and a couple of the steps mention God or higher power of the 12 steps. Three of them do. And people will literally spin on their heel and walk out the door. Yeah. You know, they're thrown out the baby with the bathwater. It's it's like, come on, you know, just <laughs> your life is not working. You got a whole bunch of people in this room who are using these 12 steps and it's working for them, you know, maybe you can take what you like and leave the rest. Um, I would also and, bring there for, for, for folks um, like that. And I think that's completely valid. Don't let God stop you here. He hasn't before. So um, yeah. it's all right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and even in 12 step programs, you know, the, the third step reads, you know, God, as you understand God, they, they, they tacked that on because everybody understands God and higher power in a different way. Um, you know, I came in as an atheist or an agnostic, depending on my mood in the day. And, you know, I am neither of those things now, but nor am I um, what I would call religious. Um, mm -hmm. I have found a connection to a higher power that has nothing to do with the church in which I was raised. Um, I don't think that church is wrong. I don't think it's right. I, I think, you know, it, it serves a lot of people really, really well. Um, it wasn't right for me. Um, and I had to open my mind. I had to be willing to become willing, so to speak, 
um, I, you know, just just be willing to consider possibilities other than you know what I think is right or what I think is wrong, you know, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. I had to become open-minded um, to make progress in my recovery. And, um, and that really meant sometimes, you know, listening and going, okay, that's not for me, but thank you for sharing. Um, it's, but it's taking super, the good parts out of that same share. Yeah. It's a super important recovery and relationship skill to be able to be in something that you know is not you and to stay in it. That's called differentiation. And it's absolutely essential for healthy relationships and uh, finding or developing our identity and recovery. So it can be a really important exercise to, you know, I, I was thinking the other day about, you know, big changes that have happened in my life. And one of the principles that I started living by that, that um, helped those changes be made is um, when I seek help, I'm going to do everything that the person that I'm seeking help from says to do, unless I have a visceral, like, no. <laughs> um, and it's been transformative. And there's been a lot of like, hey, why don't you look at this or listen to this that initially I've been like, there's nothing there for me. And I'm really glad that I went through with it anyway. Um, not because there was always something there valuable, but I always had a clear sense of what I thought and felt as a result of when you talk about the openness and um, you know being being connected to or exposed to a lot of different things, um, you will walk away with a clearer sense of who you are. And that's, that's I think, what recovery is all about. Yeah, I, I agree totally. It's, um, and it, it, it is a good book. Um, and there is some very useful information about emotional sobriety in it. Um, and like, you know, again, take what you like, leave the rest. Um, so yeah, um, that's our, we're out of questions. We're out of time. Um, John, anything you want to say to take us out? Thank you everybody for the great questions and I'll look forward to being back on in a couple of weeks. Yep, we'll see you then. Thanks everybody. Um, we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>